the Mindset Athlete Podcast, and I'm your host, James Roberts. I'm a two-time Paralympian and owner of James Robert Fitness, which is an online training, nutrition, and mindset coaching business. First of all, I'd like to thank Lauren Williams for suggesting this quote to the show. An athlete is a mindset. It's how you prepare, think, and execute. Not because of some elite status or physical stature. Anybody can be an athlete. By Chris Hart. And each week on the Mindset Athlete, we like to bring you inspirational athletes, a message, or experts talking about human optimization to teach you how to change your perception of your mindset and become 1% better. And on today's show, I've got Clifford Starks. He graduated in kinesiology in 2005 and became a personal trainer and also became a professional fighter in between the dates of 2009 to 2017. So welcome on to the show, Clifford. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Oh, the pleasure is all mine. So before we delve into today's episode, Clifford, um, beyond the initial introduction, and we will go into it a little bit more in terms of your story uh, later on, is there any bits beyond what I was able to do through my research that you want to tell the audience? Um, other than the fact that I got into coaching, like success coaching, and I didn't realize I was doing it as I was a personal trainer too. The reason I know this is because I got certified in a couple organizations, coaching organizations, and realized like, oh, you learn all of this through the process of being a personal trainer. As in, in terms of what kind of successes do you mean most specifically? So what it really comes yeah, what it really comes down to is you got to get the strategies right. You got to get the mindset right. And you got to make people accountable one way or another. And in order to do those three things, it comes down to the stories that you tell them and the stories that they tell themselves. Like that's where all the power's at. Um, most of us have a basic understanding of strategy. Even if you were to get an expert, they might tell you one or two different things that might change things a little bit, but it comes down to just getting it in and practicing it. It's the same thing as riding a bike. You can talk a person through all the strategies all day long and they have an idea of what it takes to ride the bike, but you got to fall. And that fall can either be devastating or the best fall ever. It depends on how you approach it. And so as a personal trainer, what I learned was it's not necessarily the training that's important. It's the approach to the training. Do you think from that basis then, Clifford, then coming from your background within fighting where strategy and strategy is paramount helps? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Like, so... Everybody has like, you, you've heard the saying by Mike Tyson, everyone has a plan till they get punched in the face. And it's very true. So strategy is only going to take you so far. Like, you know, you have an idea, especially when you fight at the elite level, you have an idea of what your opponent's going to do. It's not like you go in there like, I wonder what he's going to do this time. Like they have pretty similar patterns. And so it's not the pattern that you have to fight against. It is getting the mindset right. It's getting your physical capabilities right. It's conditioning your body correctly. It's doing all those little things that, that change the game by the inches. It comes down to those small, small, minute inches. But talk to me about your mindset of, of be it, I, I did professional sport, but I didn't get hit in the head in, for a living. Yeah, it's different. It's definitely different. And let me tell you, what I loved about fighting so much is it put you in a situation to hear all of those voices, like all of those scared, freaked out, anxious voices of saying, what in the hell are you doing? Why are you walking to that cage? Don't you know what's going to happen? And doing it anyway. And so some people talk about like, just be fearless. There's no such thing because we're human beings we're going to experience those things. And it's what we do with those things. And that's why I, I respect and appreciated fighting so much because 
I, I went into the danger zone knowing the dangers. And so the best fighters, like everyone starts off as a fighter. Everybody talks about how they're a fighter. Like, oh, I'm a fighter, I'm a fighter this, I'm a fighter that. You're not a fighter until you go through a fight camp and then you actually take the fight, you sign the contract, you do the things you need to do, and then you're in that cage fighting. And then there's another fight after that fight because everyone thinks you can just punch someone in the face and they're going to go out. And then they start realizing, no, it's not always that easy. And you ask yourself the question, like, this person hasn't gone out yet and they're fighting back. And so may the best man or woman win that day. But the best way to go about it is to know, like, you are testing your mind and your body. You're testing everything about yourself in that fight. And that's why the best fighters, like, they'll hug it out at the end because they know they both push their bodies and their minds to the limit. And they got to see who the better person was that day. And then you just go on and you just do your best to learn from the experience and get better the next time. Both fighters need to do that. Do you think then from that basis, that's as close as you're going to get to say from a historical standpoint, be it uh, Knights of the Round Table and if you go all the way back to like our predecessors like Neanderthals and things like that, do you think that's as close sport-wise as you're going to get to what was life or death? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, most definitely. Because it's just there's something primal about it And it's to understand the primalness of it and respect the primalness of it. The good thing is you have a ref that can jump in and save you. They don't always jump in on time, but most of the time they do a pretty good job at it. And it's going to test you. It's going to test you in ways you've never been tested before. But that's a beautiful thing because you can take that and use that in all areas of your life. And this is a, a nice quote that I that I saw that you, you were saying, and I'll reword it slightly, is I love your saying, if knowledge was all it took, everyone would have a six pack and be a millionaire. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It's simple to talk about all the strategy. But why do you think some people, they, they obviously it's wishful thinking, they would like to have something, but then when it comes time to action it, why do you think some people back away from that challenge? One, I don't think they're passionate enough about it. Two, I don't think they've been told the right story. Um, one thing that I really liked as a personal trainer was, so going, helping a person go from they're already in pretty good shape to peak shape, that was never hard for me to do because they already had their own momentum building them where they needed to go. But when you take an individual who may be overweight or even obese and taking them through that story, it was a little more difficult. It was a it was it was harder to do to get them from where they were to where I knew they could be at first. But as I got better at it, it's the stories I tell them and it's the stories they tell themselves. So they practiced a certain way for a period of time. And it's not to say like a person needs to love themselves at all times to even have a chance. But you know, when you're not giving yourself self self love, you know, when you're, when you're effing up, when it really comes down to it. And I allow people to be honest with themselves because when you're honest with yourself, you actually take your power in your hand. And some people think that's the reverse. Like, all right, if I just, If I pretend that it's society's fault, if I pretend it's this external thing, then I'll be okay. And it's like, no, look in the mirror. Look in the mirror and see the power that you possess and see what you've been doing to yourself. Be honest with yourself. You you would agree with this statement now, Clifford. That's a victim mentality if you pass the buck. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing is, too, I am going through my process. I will allow a victim to be a victim. This is why. This is the only reason why. I will say you have two options. You can do it this way or you can do it this other way. This is what will happen if you continue to do it this way. This is what will happen if you change it. 
the choice is yours. I have not seen a person say, ah, you know, I want to stay a victim. <laughs> I've never, I've never seen it at least. Um, well, it's obviously not, not within that sphere, but be, how about an athlete per se that, okay, people, this is probably where people outside of the athlete and athlete mentality struggle to, mm. to actually get inside of their head in terms of why would you want to be barbaric to yourself, you know, as and go through yeah. the run of the mill day in, day out, put your body through extremes amount of pressure, both physically mm. and mentally to come out the other side. So I think, and then this is where I'm going to use my argument per se to what you've said. Yeah. The, obviously the athlete is the most critical of themselves. And obviously that's a, not really a Very, victim, but it's yeah. it's the neg- it's the wrong type of emotional state. No, I agree with that. Um, I also I also believe there's you'll see certain coaches who are just damn good at what they do. They get the best out of their athlete, and they get the best out of their athlete because they get the best that individual out of their athlete. There's not a cookie cutter way of doing this. You can't say, all right, everybody do it this way. It's not going to work, right? But you can get the best out of each athlete. And so there's a, there's a place where we, we talk about transformation, right? Have a person going through a transformation. You don't transform the spirit. You don't. It's just there. You just remind it that it's there. We talk about you have physical transformation. You can have mental transformation. You can have those things. But there's a spirit in an individual when they know when they're feeling good. They know when they're feeling free. They know when they're at their best. And they know when they're at their worst. And so people get used to either having a positive set of habits or a negative set of habits. But the you is still in there. It's in there. There's a light in each individual. And it's about allowing a person to look at their light. That's what I teach people to do. Look into your light. Look where you're strong. Because when a person's strong, they they actually don't want to put their thumb on other people. They don't want to make other people small because they're too busy making themselves big. And that even comes in the fighting realm. Like we talk about there's a winner and a loser in fighting, but there really isn't. Everyone wins if everyone's going all in. So if you have two solid fighters who are fighting their best fight and they're so-called a winner and a loser, there's a winner and a learner. One's learning, okay, this is what I can do to change. What do I do to get better? How do I get better? What do I do? Where did I mess up? The fans love it because they get to see a great fight. And then there's a guy who wins. So everybody wins when you're, when you're going into your light and not turning it into this external thing. That's what gets people in trouble. But what was your trigger then, more specifically? What, what, what would you do to be, get the best out of yourself? Uh, what I would do to get the best out of myself, it really comes down to the people. It started with this. It started with the people I surrounded myself with. Those who were uplifting, those who would listen to me, those who would have discussion with me. Even with what we're doing back and forth right now, we're having a discussion. I love doing that. I love hearing different points of view. Um, But I also do believe that this comes down to that victim mentality that we were talking about is you can't always have those options. Like you're not always going to be in that situation. So as, as human beings, there's two things that we want. We're either going towards pleasure or going away from pain, right? And what I did was I took a U-turn And I started going into the pain because if you go into the pain, if you force into the pain, then that's where the true growth is. That's where your strongest self is. And that's hard to do because we're taught to, well, we don't want to be in any pain. We don't want to have adversity, but that's where our best lessons are. That's where our true strength is. That's part of the journey. People don't want to hear that. They want to say, well, there's got to be a way to do it without that process. But you have to take the process. It would be like me saying, like, how do I become a good fighter without having to take any lumps? (laughs) 
Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but in terms of when, when you say, obviously, go through the process and take the life lessons, you obviously mean more from a both a mindset perspective, a mindfulness approach, and also a um, psychological one. Whereas I think, whereas no athlete would shun away from the physical one because it's 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 mm-hmm. kind of a I'm going to use the term loosely a given. It's it's it, it's there's not even it's a but yeah. it's, it's a must. It's it it doesn't matter. It it's not even seen as a process. It's, it's I want to get from whatever A is the starting point to B. What is the result? And it's whatever I have to endure, 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 should I say, and just get on with it. It doesn't matter if it's easy. It doesn't matter if it's hard. I'm going to do it. Whereas I think maybe from the general populace, they can't get their head around that. Whereas if you then stretch it beyond that, and then it's obviously the the, the actual mind one, it's very, very mm-hmm. difficult. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I 100% agree with that. I think the cool thing with athletics is you learn real quick that you're not the biggest dog. Like every dog has its day. It's just the way that it goes. And so when you can see that and there, there's real tangible results with that too. Like there is like, okay, I won today. Okay. I didn't win today. Like you get tangible results and that's a good thing. Now we're trying to almost fluff that away and turn it into like everybody's a winner all the time. Like that's dangerous to do because you don't get to understand you and you don't get to understand your strengths because everybody has different strengths too. And understanding that and respecting that and just being like, yeah, I'm my best me. That's it. I don't have to be, I don't have to prove anything to anybody else. I'm going to be my best me. So for an athletic event, I'm going to do my best work that I can do to get ready for it and perform the best that I can perform. I'll tell you, I had one story. Um, it was a training. I was getting ready, having training camp, and I'm having guys rotate in. A, and I didn't look bad, per se, but I quit in my mind. I felt it. felt myself quit. And I was pissed. I was just like, that's never going to happen again. Because the thing is, the more you do it, the easier it becomes to do. And even if the crowd can't see it, you can see it. You know it's there, especially if you're used to not doing it. And so I went through the process of making sure that I wouldn't do that again. So anger and guilt and, and all of that, that can be beneficial. But if you use it as fuel, as energy, I could have been pissy about it and angry and said, I don't, uh, uh, but that's not going to change anything. I got mad and I did something about it. Not mad anymore. See what I mean? But some people, you, you're right. You're hundred percent right. Some people will hold on to this weird thing. That's really not helping them propel forward. It's really moving them backwards. But then that's would you, part of the awareness. But would you not argue that be it if you're in an athletic position, you would probably be able to tell you you to some extent be able to tell this negative energy because you probably could see it easier in kids or teenagers because the head goes mm-hmm. down, it's, the body mm-hmm. language is wrong. Whereas I think you pick up on those subtleties quite quickly, even if you don't even see a score, you can tell you can tell they will. Well, you've mentally given up here. You can you can tell you you you've thrown in the towel, so to speak, because just by your body language, it's okay. I've won now. I can just keep turning the screw now, and and you're not going to do anything about it. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean a person can go through. They people are really just going through their own journey. And my whole thing is, you ever heard the saying, "When the student's ready, the master will appear." Nope, I haven't. Okay, yeah. So they talk about, yeah, they say when, when a student is ready, the, the right master will come for them. And they'll, be, they'll see things in a different lens and a different light. Um, people, since people are all going through their own journey and their own process, things will come when they need them to come. You, you can't force anything. That's another thing that I learned is the more you force something, the more you're actually retracting it instead of allowing it to be what it needs to be. 
there's processes you have to go through, but it doesn't have to be a forceful process. Well, it's push. It, well, the the other anecdote we'll move to that is pushing against the against the current. You're never going to win that one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, life life will get you after a while. <laughs> And I think you raised an interesting point there in terms of cover. You, you know, as in, obviously, we're setting up athletes to not succeed. Be it, and I think it's this sh- men, momentum shift between what is happening more and more in society. You know, like this gray area. Mm-hmm. And then I think sport used to be very clear cut as you win or you lose. It's black and white. There's nothing in between. Okay. There are sports that tie, there's such thing as a tie, but that was built into the process of the sport. So that's, that's, uh, mm. in, intangible all in itself. But I think this gray area coming across into sport, obviously you, you say it's, it's, it's not giving an individual a chance to find out who they are. Mm-hmm. And obviously they're going to be more and more where, where they feel probably more comfortable. And I can generalize to that be sport business where your strengths lie you will not be able to find that because as a result of this wishy-washy approach yeah yeah i mean i definitely agree with that it comes down to life has a bunch of gray areas and there is i i think having a black and white is important as well it, it, it would be like what is integrity <laughs> you know, like, well, my thought of integrity is not to lie, not to cheat, not to steal. Like, well, like, and so it, it's, it's. Oh, yeah, we're going into a gray area there with sport, though. Aren't yeah, we? yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's complicated. And it, it's, I, I do like to say, like, life has its virtue and there's vices on each end. So you have your virtue and you have your vices. And so to say, like, Always love yourself. Do everything you can to love yourself. But if you're loving yourself so much, like you're this superior narcissist and you don't care about anybody else, then I think that's an issue. But I also think it's an issue if you're just loving everybody else and not yourself. It's about finding that balance and understanding there are black and white areas too. Understanding that and, and figuring, out, figuring out your gray. I guess would be the best way to put it. Figuring out you're great and the society is going to do what the society is going to do. It's going to create new gray areas all the time. It's doing that as we speak. Um, and we need to figure out the right, you know, I mean, I, I think as human beings, we all have a distinctive, this is right. We know a right from a wrong. Most people know that even when they're, even if they're doing the wrong all the time, they know that it's wrong and they know what is right. But do you think that that is kind of super inceded because and I'm not going to blame social media for once, be it it's yeah. brought down the boundaries, be it, you know, what is black and white uh, and people are trying to get admiration in the wrong way per se, be it I, I read, I think today that Facebook is looking to get rid of the likes altogether. I think that they were, imp- they'd implemented something with Instagram to try it, be it, but then somebody's going to, from a, a gratification standpoint, they're going to go seek it somewhere else. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting conversation. And I do agree with that. I think they, they say that, Times change and generations change. And I think we're all way more the same than we realize. Just because we went from a drug addiction, maybe, to a Facebook addiction, to whatever new addiction a person may have. And addiction is an addiction. And it's about figuring out, are you addicted to something or are you not addicted to something? And it goes back to that go into the pain. Because when you go into your pain, you understand yourself, you understand your triggers, you understand your strengths, and you understand your weaknesses. And so I think the best people who are able to fight an addiction are the ones that have overcome an addiction before. And in order to overcome an addiction, you have to admit that you have an addiction. Well, a lot of people won't want to do that. <laughs> 
be it for scarcity yeah. reasons, uh, yeah. other people's opinions, other people's beliefs, um, how they're going to obviously think of themselves and how they're going to treat themselves. Yeah, it's it's one of the hardest things to do. But it, it's funny that that phrase, if it wasn't, if it was easy, then everybody would do it. That's kind of the truth. Like, I, I wish there was another way of saying it. But going into your pain, understanding your suffering, understanding all of that stuff, it creates a new self awareness. But that's not easy to do. It's really not easy to do. You know, I take everyone through a process and I say people can function at a one and function all the way to a 10. When you're functioning at a 10, you're just taking ultimate responsibility. When you're functioning at a one, you're victimizing. It's everyone else's fault but yours. It's this external thing. Functioning at a 10, you go very internal. And to function at a 10, that's not always the easiest thing to do. It's the most empowering thing to do, but it's not always the easiest thing to do. Functioning at a one, it can be easy because you can just play the blame game and point at everything else and say, I'm just a leaf in the river. It's not my fault. Well, how did you get there in the first place, though? <laughs> Let me like, use that yeah, yeah. Music logically. Mm-hmm. And I go, so my thing is I, you can take a one functioner and you can, you can move them up the line, but you can't turn a one into a 10 instantly. It just doesn't happen that way. They'll have glimpses of 10 moments, but it's a practice thing. It's a practice thing. It takes energy. It takes effort. It takes rebuilding habits. Like I said, easy are the good habits. They're easy to develop. It's just the bad habits are easy to develop too. But do you think from the, the adversity standpoint now, Clifford, that you were mm-hmm. in somewhat of a, I will call it an advantage, better place both, I won't say both, say mentally because you're mm-hmm. in, in hardship, I won't say all the time, but be it you're replicating your environment of competition on a on a daily basis in a camp environment so i do think that ultimately when you're our bodies are meant to grow and and to persevere and so when we're put into a state that's got a lot of pressure we can t- we can handle it Like the cool thing is people can handle whatever they put in front of them. You know what I mean? Like, it's just like, I ask people like, well, you're still here. You know, like you're still here. Worst case scenario, the worst thing could happen, but you're still here. And so the fact that you're still here is just like, it's saying, okay, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do with it? And I'll give like, I think faith is one of the most important, powerful things that we can have. But I think faith is something that we should practice consistently. So when we really need it, it's already there. Instead of, I don't know, I'm going to get through this. It's like this turmoil, anxious, fearful thing. But if you practice your faith, your gratitude, you practice certain things consistently, life is going to throw something at you eventually. And when it does, it's not a big deal. You're just kind of like, okay, well, I've done this before. It's the same thing as a a person who does 50 push-ups on a regular basis. They try to do 60 push-ups or 70 push-ups, and they're able to do it relatively easy. But if you take a person who never does push-ups ever, and one day they have to do 70 push-ups, it's the most painful thing ever, and they're feeling it for weeks. And so that's how I look at life. I, I just look at it as like, I might as well test myself because life's going to test me eventually anyway. And when it does, I'll be ready for it. So would you say a better way of looking at it? And I, and I, and I do get periodically people say, oh, I hope I achieve something. Do you think that's a negative way of looking at something? Because you, you're having wishful thinking as opposed to not thinking it into existence, but you're having... F- like you said, faith that it will transpire and come to fruition. Yeah, I think that's inter- That's that's going to be a layered argument for each individual. 
Like you have certain individuals who just have this unwavering belief in themselves. And I think everybody has to get to that in order to make things come to fruition. But if you don't really believe in yourself and all of a sudden, like you say, I can do it. I know I can, but you're lying to yourself. Then you're just going to self-sabotage yourself. So it depends on the individual. If you're at a place where you can say that and you can feel good saying it, then say it. But if you're at a place where you say, I hope I can do this, then start with something small that you know that you'll actually get and then build the momentum that way until you, until you reach that new momentum point where you can say with authority, I will make this happen. But where did you get to the point between belief and arrogance then, in, in your opinion? Hmm. That's a tough one because we all have our own projections. So I can, I can say something and you can project it as arrogance, but into me it's belief. Or you can have your own belief in yourself, a belief enough in yourself that if I say something, all of a sudden it's not, it doesn't feel arrogant. I don't, I don't look at a person and say, oh man, that's an arrogant individual. I just look at them and say, what's their story? Why is their story that way? Why do they think that? I don't think it's an, I, I don't think it's as easy to call someone arrogant because sometimes that's people really looking at themselves saying that person's doing something I wish I would have done. That's a different perspective and different spin. That's, I think that's, yeah. I think that's an eye opener in terms of, I think it's the argument I've had, I've tried to portray, but maybe I didn't look at it as belief versus arrogance. I think I coined it as, you know, um, overconfidence versus arrogance and, and that the margin of error is even smaller between those two. Mm -hmm. But in terms of coming back to what we were talking about, in terms of the belief, does it down, then come down to be putting process into place? Okay, for the athlete per se, it's a little bit easier because it comes back to hours and hours of repetition of, well, from the sport per se, physical standpoint, you go on autopilot. So it, it's you can concentrate more on the, the subconscious. Whereas maybe with if we look at it from the outside perspective, the general populace now, that's, that's, that's sometimes very difficult because they're trying to juggle, I would say, not just two plates, but multiple plates. And then they, they, they see it as I'm getting by. But then if you, took, you, you, you looked it through, be it another set of eyes, mm. you would see overwhelmed because it's like, well, you, you've got, the other anecdote one would be you've got too many you've got your fingers and all the all the pies. It's and you don't yeah. you don't see that. Whereas if you look at it from another perspective, somebody else's perspective, you would probably say, okay, yeah, maybe I am trying to juggle too much. Yeah, I a hundred percent agree with that. I think, and that's the beauty of of being an athlete and even being an elite athlete is you have to focus your energy. And I think we, we teach ourselves like we need to do all things at the same time and do them all half-ass. And for some strange reason, if a person gets used to doing things at a half-ass rate, a bunch of things, they think they're doing it pretty good, but they're not. See, that's where the, the tangibleness of being an athlete kind of plays out. So you'll know like, wow, why am I sucking at this? Why do I suck at this thing? It'd be like a race car driver, right? The people talk about how, oh, I can talk on my phone and drive in the car. Well, can you? Like, try and do that as a NASCAR driver. Try and drive in NASCAR and talk on your phone. It's probably going to end really badly. And so people think because they can do two things half-ass that they could somehow do them both excellently at the same time. But they're like, oh, yeah, I'm a multitasker. As human beings, we're not built to multi. We're not built for that. But for some strange reason, we teach ourselves that we're built for these things that we're not built for. And I think partially that's why the depression rate's so high too. It's just like people are trying to do things they're not built to do. But would you argue from the athlete perspective now, Clifford, it, it, it is 
it's not multitasking really, but it's it is over uh, I call a day to day routine. You are able oh. to implement multiple multiple tasks from that basis. As but okay, for argument's sake, this is probably where it will agree with you. You are concentrating one hundred percent on that particular task at one moment in time, and then moving Absolutely. on to the next one. In the present moment, yes. Like I can't. I love being a father. I love being a husband. I cannot focus on being a father and a husband when I got another guy trying to punch me in the face. Like yes, it's not going to work. But when I am done in that present moment, when I am finished with the job that I had set out to do, and I am out of that cage. Now my presence goes somewhere else and focuses in on that one thing. I'm not trying to focus on a million and one different things at a present moment. It's not possible. Not to do it well, at least. Do you think that's why athletes are termed, and I'm going to quote my family to a certain extent, narrow-minded, single-focused, um, oh, what's the one that's really, really bad? It eludes me the word, but it'll probably come back to me in terms of that's why they're able to be so, so, so and you could you put the outliers within CEOs within uh-huh. business as well because they focus on them not in, not necessarily themselves but I'm dialed in hundred percent everything else on the periphery of what is me for yeah. this moment in time is not not irrelevant but it's not important in the grand scheme of things of right now. Yeah, I mean they're they're focused in a moment of time and. This, this is going to kind of suck for me to say, but if you're, if you're going elite or going high level, some people are going to have issues with that. They are not going to like that. I had one client who lost over 100 pounds, and instead of cheering her on, look, she went from 260 to 160. That's not anorexic. But everyone, oh, you need to eat, girl. Oh, you're, oh, you're losing too much weight. Oh, my goodness. What's it? I wasn't starving her. I know what I'm doing. But what the world, they want to keep you in this box because it makes them see who they are. And that sucks sometimes. And that's what gets people in trouble. It's just like, no, she lost 100 pounds of fat. What are you talking about? 100 pounds of fat has been taken off of this person's body. And it's an issue now. Because now people got to look in the mirror and say, have I been doing it wrong all this time? But what would you put that down? What would you put that down to? Envy, envy, jealousy? um, Gosh. What else could you call it? Um, I want to hold you back in terms of I don't like where you're going. Yeah. Um, I I call it living in this effed up box that they've created and not realizing it. That's what I call that. Because who, who holds another person down? Like seriously. And they don't, they might not even mean to do it. They don't even mean to do it. But it's up to the outliers to say, F this, we're better than this. We can do more. We can become more. Because it happens every generation. Every time there's an outlier who says, no, nah, we can do more than this. No, it's not, oh, well, I'm just big boned, or I'm this, or I'm that. And it can be anything. Oh, human beings will never fly. Oh, we'll never run a four-minute mile. You'll never make a million dollars in such and such a time. There's a million and one different reasons to why our own society tries to hold us in this safe zone of, okay, let's just stay right here now. Let's just stay right here. Let's not question anything. Let's not do anything crazy. Let's not go outside of the cave. And it takes a person to go, yeah, I'm going to do this. Yeah, I'm going to go a little bit further. Yeah, I'm going to push a little bit more. Oh, you're crazy. You're nuts. And then everybody ends up doing it. That's the beauty of the game. I just look at it like, you know what? That's just the beauty of the game. Can't get mad at it. It's the game. So you do your best. 
you do your damn best. Like me as a speaker, I want people to say, I'm going to go outside and try the craziest shit that I can and see how far I can go, see how much I can do. Create something worth remembering. But only some will do that. But does it come back to your argument that you said in the very start of the episode, it's, it's getting on that bike and falling off and remembering it's not a bad thing to fall? You have to 100% do that. You have to 100% do that. Because there's nothing scarier than saying something and the entire world disagreeing with you or poking you for it. That's scary. But it's also the most rewarding thing you can do because now you've just said to yourself, I have given myself the opportunity and the ability to do it anyway, to try it anyway. That's how you learn. You learn through the suffering that you take. Because we're all going to say stupid things from time to time. I'm going to have my time where I'll get on an episode and maybe someone will be like, oh, man, he sucked. And it is what it is. And maybe I did that day. Maybe you're like, oh, you know, I said something stupid. Or, no, it wasn't that stupid. Or, it, it's, it's playing the field and figuring it out and putting it together. But, again, just as I was saying, yeah, you got to get on that bike. You got to get on that bike and fall and be willing to take bumps because that's where you learn your biggest lessons. But coming back to that, that actual saying now, Clifford, what per se changes for, for your, obviously your opinion that mm-hmm. we're okay uh, as children to take those lumps, those bumps, those, the scrapes, obviously everything under the sun in terms of an injury wise, what actually, mm-hmm. what, what's kind of clicks or click clicks on in terms of, okay, that is no longer acceptable. Well, um, I think society tries to keep us in the box that I was talking about. And it's not – the society does it out of love. Like, people do things out of love. It's just like your parents, if you had your – how close are you with your parents? Very close. Very close. So your parents probably want you to be safe. Like, there, you could, mom, dad, if I go around this corner, I get $10 million. Well, what ha- Well, wait, what's going on? Why, why do you have to go around the corner? What's around the corner? Are you sure? Like, it's all of that. And that's just protection, 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 protection. And in your head, you're like, I'm going for it. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going for it. And so... Everyone externally tries to put their pieces of their own perception on you. Just like everyone does it. We all do it. I do it too. I'm going to try and do it as little as I can. But I'm going to tell my son, like, son, I just want you to know he's only three right now. But as he gets older and he's able to have this conversation, I'm going to let him know, like, daddy did the best that he could. And he hoped he taught you as much as he possibly could. But you have to live your life. No matter what mommy says, no matter what daddy says, no matter what anybody says, live your life and live and make it a damn good one. Make it a damn good life. And daddy's going to disagree with things because he's going to be looking at it from his perspective. And he wants you to be safe all the time. So even myself, it's not easy to do. So now take an entire society doing that to you. But do you think an athlete is better suited to be able to push back against obviously those thoughts, those beliefs somebody has? If I use my story, um, God, how long ago would this have been? 2019. Safe argument say like just over 10 years ago. My, my oh. aunt and uncle said, well, why don't you get a real job? And I was like, well, mm-hmm. I'll hear you out because... Obviously, it comes from, from a state of love. They, they have the, your best intentions at heart. They want you to be safe, uh, secure, and functionally, obviously, stable. Whereas I was like, well, mm-hmm. I hear your argument because that's how I was brought up. Mm-hmm. But I don't see myself going down that route per se right now. I've got no problem with it. When the athletic career comes to a head, be it 
well, I probably didn't envision the career I had, but you want to push it and extend it as long as possible. Yeah. And then go into what is quote unquote the real world as opposed to be dictated. Well, you need to do it now. Do you think because of that inner belief, I'm going to back myself 100%. I'm 100% all in and we'll see where we take it. Mentality puts them in a better position to be able to push back against those, those beliefs that other people have society has for you. I 100% think that. Yeah. I think uh, the biggest thing is, so we talk about, we talk about being tested, right. And the power of the test. Yeah. And putting that together. And so, um, you get tested as an athlete. You just, you're going to get tested and it's going to be tangible. And I think that's important for people to have because it's going to help a person understand themselves more. Like you, you can't, un, you're going to understand so many different things about yourself and you're going to understand where you stand and what you have to do to move forward. It's like even for fighting, for instance, I'll say the only way you become one of the best fighters or an elite fighter is by fighting with other elite fighters. But you have to go through a process too. You can't just fight with an elite fighter right away, but you have to go through a step. You, it's stepping stones. It's just like <clears throat> the coolest thing about being an athlete, you are forced to have a goal. There's a date that you have to show up. Now, how often do people have days they have to actually show up? We we're talking about be automating it. Yeah, you can automate your life. You never have to show up. It's automated. There's no date. There's no special time. You don't have to have like that moment where you're doing things. The best time I've ever had with training women, you want to talk about not having to say a story or not having to say anything. They just do it. Wedding time. When it's time for a wedding, all of a sudden, everyone's eating right. All of a sudden, everyone's exercising right. All of a sudden, everyone's doing everything they need to do. Because there's a goal set. There's a date. And that's what athletes are given. It's like game time. We have game time this day. We have game time this day. And so you have to push yourself. Because you know what's going to happen if you don't. Would you say what would come a close second for 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 be it your client specifically? Would it be uh, looking for a hol- looking towards a holiday or vacation, or is it no? There's no nothing that comes close to be it getting ready for a wedding. I have to create the date for them. Honestly, like I have to, we and we have to sit down together and game plan a date, and we have to mark it down. And once it's marked down, it makes it really real. Another thing, uh, I had a bunch of clients do figure competitions. And so they knew they had to get ready. And boy, did they get ready. Like, no one wants to look stupid in front of everybody. Nobody likes that feeling. So whatever date it may be, whatever, there there has to be some relevance and some importance to them on that date. You got to put, you got to kind of push on the pain points too. If you push in a pain point, like what will happen if you don't get to this goal? What do you see? Because that will make it much more real for them. Then, ah, you know, if I, whatever, like, it's kind of like when they, we talk about entrepreneurs and an entrepreneur, they'll ask a question like, so how long do you expect for this targeted goal to, however long it takes, like, well, what does that even mean? However long it takes. Well, you're going to be 90 years old. And, and if you love what you, what you do just for the sake of loving it, the more power to you. But if you're looking to make millions of dollars and you're saying to yourself, I want to make millions. I want to get there. I'm passionate. Whenever, whenever long it takes, however long it takes. Are you really being serious with your goal then? And that's, that's a coach's job to really ask you the deep, dark questions that people really don't want to hear sometimes. But do, do do you think 
an athlete sometimes needs to hear that, you know, pushing on the pains, pu- uh, pushing people. I know people are obviously very individualistic in terms of what works for you will, will per se not work for me and vice versa. Yeah. But do you think a coach can sometimes push on those buttons? Be it, it doesn't always have to be a, a pain point, but be finding that person's trigger to obviously get the the best out of. For me, it's it's probably very very yeah. hard for a coach because what if I've had said of me in the past, which James is going to turn up, and that must be quite scary. Yeah. I, I never saw it as be a negative comment because it's quite quite interesting. It's like well. And it, and and when the ruthless one does come, when the ruthless one has come out in the past, I've been very brutal to to be who has been on the other end of it, and I don't yeah. I don't know what would per se the one that springs to mind would have been a trials about twelve years ago with Rowan, and I think it probably was a trigger, be it oh it was meant to be final selection, but they changed their mind. It's like no, I'm gonna kick the guy's ass then and, and prove a point and say well, <laughs> here you go. If 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 you if you say it's not final, I'm going to put a stamp on it and say it sure as hell should be. And okay, they turned around and said, oh, "Well, we're still going to give him a bit of time." So I was like, "Well," and I think I ended up beating the person by like thirty seconds. So in in my eyes, there's no coming back from that. So yeah. I, I I kind of thought to myself, "Well, I'm not going to humiliate the person again because it's not his fault. It's the system. I'll play the system." Mm-hmm. And, and just beat him and, and, and just do what needs to be done. And, and I, I already proved that I was the better athlete on the day. And mm. from a systematic being what sport is, it likes to throw you curveballs. That was one. It's like, okay, I've pressed, I've set the precedent. I've, I've set the, the ball down. There's, uh, there's no going back from me. However, mm. I'm just going to be, I'll, I know I'm good enough to beat the person, but I'm not going to humiliate them for a second time. Cause there's, there's no point. Cause they may not, they may never come back from, from that defeat from, from a moral yeah. perspective. So I think some athletes probably wouldn't like to hear that, but I'm not a Kobe Bryant. I'm not going to step on your throat for the sake of, but that's probably, that's me. Whereas with you, you might be somewhere on the other end of the spectrum. Whereas, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to be ruthless and do it again. Yeah, so I think it's a really this is a really cool talking point, and I'm actually glad you mentioned Kobe because I I thought of Kobe too, which is kind of crazy. Kobe was obsessed with basketball, and he admitted that he was obsessed with basketball. He's not wrong. You're not wrong. I'm not wrong. None of us are wrong for our personal opinions, because that's what they are, opinions. What do you want to be in your life? That is the question I ask people. What do you want in your life? If you want to be the very best at one specific thing, it is not up to me or anybody else to tell you not to do that, because this is what you're supposed to do. Kobe has amazed millions for his basketball skills. It doesn't work for me, but he's done a great job. And he did, he did what he came out to do. And so when, when we ask, is it a coach's job to make you your best? Hell yeah. Hell yes. And that's which bus do you belong on? And are you in the right seat of the bus? Or do you need to get on another bus? Know what an individual wants. Know what they truly want. That's what we talk about with passion. You cannot create passion. I tell stories not to create passion, but to relate to the person on something they're already passionate about. But I need to figure out what their passions are before I just tell them a story too. I can't tell a person a story and just be like, so go do the thing that we didn't talk about at all. One thing they talk about with coaching, just being able to actively listen to somebody and really understand them, understand their wants, understand their needs, understand their desires, and then teach them to how to press and get to those things that they want 
that they need, that they desire. That's all it comes down to at the end of the day. So that moves me nicely to my penultimate question to you now, and I'll make it relevant to the show for sake, for argument's sake, and I don't always do this, but from from your opinion now, how do you get a person in a position to be able to, and I'll ask your, your opinion first and foremost, to see the, def, the difference between dedication, obsession, and passion? And from, from your perspective, would they differ or or they one in themselves? I think obsession is passion. I, I do think there's a difference between obsession and addiction, though. So obsessed means like, I feel for this thing. I love this thing with my entire being. But I don't necessarily need it. I'm in the present. When I'm in the presence of it, I am thriving. And addiction is a need. Like, I need this thing. I can't function without this thing. So that's detrimental. Obsession, I think obsession is a beautiful thing. I think that's our soul speaking to us. Just saying like, man, when I'm in this realm, this feels good. That's my flow state. That's, that's my opinion on the subject. But when you're addicted, like, I need this thing. I can't, I can't do it without it. That's dangerous. That's what gets people in trouble. Is that why society views obsession in a bad way as they put the wrong um, definition to the word? Yeah, I think they I think they use obsession as addiction. Because again, it it's hard when you have your own personal lens and you're projecting something, someone might love to just work. Like they call them workaholics, but someone just might love doing that. And a person who doesn't love doing that will put the projection on saying, "Oh man, that's all you ever do." Like but is it all they ever do or is it all you're seeing them ever do it? Cause that's the other thing is like when a person sees pieces of someone's life, they think they know everything there is to know about that person. <laughs> you're like you've only seen a piece of their life and then you're going to make an assumption on it. And my final question to you before we wrap up the episode, Clifford, if you have to summarize what we've been speaking about, today into one sentence for people to take away what would that be take responsibility go inward create the life you want to create the more that you do for yourself like truly do for yourself the more power you give to do to other, for other people but focus internally and then let the external world change from that so once again, Clever, thanks again for coming on the Mindset Athlete Podcast. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, the pleasure has been all mine. If you like this episode, please do share it with your friends and do let Clifford and I know what you thought of the episode by tagging us over on Instagram at CliffordStarks1, that's C-L-I-F-F-O-R-D-S-T-A-R-K-S-1 and at James O. Roberts 11 and again, you can do the same on Twitter and Facebook. And finally, do check out his website, CliffordStarks.com. And as always, do check out my free content at fitamputee.co.uk and click on the tab, Free Resources. Make sure to check out the links they will be in the description. You can find all the show notes at mindsetgame.lipsim.com under the category Sports. So once again, thanks for listening. And I'll catch you next week for another episode of the Mindset Athlete Podcast.